Francis Jane Crosby. Fanny Crosby is a name that you may know. She wrote one of the hymns we just sung a moment ago. To God be the glory. Another well-known hymn that she wrote is Blessed Assurance. Get this. More than 9,000 other hymns are attributed to are attributed to her as author or co-author. Indeed, she was a remarkable woman used by God to bless many Christians. Born to John and Mercy Crosby in 1820 as their first child, Fanny was a precious gift. And at the young age of six weeks old, Fanny contracted an infection in both her eyes. Her parents attempted to help her, this little child, through the counsel of doctors. And and sadly, unfortunately, it made it worse, and she ended up becoming blind for the rest of her life. Now, Fanny could have felt sorry for herself, but her mother taught her not to entertain self-pity, but to instead to pursue self-sufficiency. Crosby loved poetry and and hymns, and the story goes, she was actually converted to Christ by the hymn, and the story goes that she was converted to Christ by listening to Isaac Watts' Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed. And her blindness did not prevent her from living a full life unto the Lord. Now, at one point in her life, she encountered a well-meaning minister who, who said to her, quote, I think it is a great pity that the master, when he showered so many gifts upon you, did not give you sight. And her reply, Do you know that if at birth I had been able to make one petition to my creator, that it would have been that I should be born blind? And surprised, the the minister asks, why? Her answer, I think it's posted for you behind Because when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. Because when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. Amazing words. Listen to the lyrics of another of her hymns titled, My Savior First of All. When my life work is ended... And I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see. I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side. And his smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know him. I shall know him. And redeemed by his side, I shall stand. I shall know him. I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hand. Oh, the soul-thrilling rapture when I view his blessed face and the luster of his kindly beaming eye, how my, how my full heart will praise him for the mercy, love, and grace that prepare for me in a mansion in the sky. Oh, the dear ones in glory, how they beckon me to come and are parting at the river I recall To the sweet vales of Eden, they will sing my welcome home, but I long to meet my Savior first of all. And meet her Savior indeed she has done. She now sees him in full glory and splendor in the eternal state. However, I would argue, in this life, Though blind, she got glimpses of him, glimpses of what it would be like to be with him. Indeed, we all get glimpses of God in the face of Christ. Yet we don't see him fully in this life. The cataracts of sin prevent us from truly and fully seeing him as he is. And all Christians are kind of like Fanny Crosby, blind, but seeing. 
However, a, a day is coming where we will see him. A day is fast approaching where God's people will see God in Christ as he truly is. No obstruction, no cataract of sin or ignorance blocking our vision. 1 John 3, 2 promises Jesus' followers, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Or in the words of Paul, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Christians in past generations have called this moment the beatific vision. Beatific as in B-E-A-T-I-F-I-C, beatific, meaning the sight that makes happy. What wonder it will be when we see him as he is. And isn't it fitting for us who've been studying with regard to the Beatitudes? Blessed means happy or flourishing. Blessed or happy or flourishing are the ones who are poor in spirit. Or those who mourn or the meek or those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Or blessed are the merciful or blessed are the pure in heart or blessed are the peacemakers or blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Happy are those. And we get to this beatitude, the beatific vision, the, the sight that makes happy. And the heart longing of every human is to be in a state of eternal bliss. The scripture reveals that state of eternal bliss can only be found in the presence of our triune God, our creator, redeemer, savior, brother, friend, and counselor. It is when we are in the presence of him whom we were created for, then and only then will we be truly satisfied. What that means is, while here on this earth, we will always be looking forward. We will always be longing. We will always be waiting for the moment we will see him whom our soul finds eternal and lasting delight. Then, I guess the question is, what enables a person to get to that point? What enables a person to see God? If it's right to say, and and I think it is, that Fanny Crosby got significant glimpses of her Savior in this life, even though she was blind, what makes us able to, to say that she got those glimpses? What qualifies a person to see God? How can someone know he or she will eventually enter into the eternally joyful presence of God who indeed satisfies the human soul? Well, we turn to Jesus' famous sayings for the answer. If you have not done so already, I'd invite you to open up your copy of the scriptures to Matthew chapter 5. This morning we're in Beatitude 6 of 8, and these famous sayings have been the topic of our study for the past several weeks. They make up the first portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, both as a sage philosopher, but also as an authoritative preacher. By the way, Jesus was actually sitting when he preached this sermon This philosopher preacher offers a pathway to the good life. And the culmination of the good life is actually to see God in all his glory. There's actually a tension in scripture of of seeing God. What does it mean to see God? What is to be in his perfect presence? To know him unhindered? To experience the perfection of true happiness? 
The tension is witnessed in someone like Moses where he pleads with Yahweh atop Mount Sinai in Exodus 33 saying, please show me your glory. And then Yahweh responds, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. Then you know in that story, the Lord puts him in the cleft of the rock and he says, I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. And I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. On the other hand, we have accounts like Isaiah 6, where the prophet receives a vision from the Lord, and his response is, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. If you know that story from Isaiah 6, Isaiah ends up living. Now, by the time we get to the New Testament, the spiritual reality is to see Jesus is to see God himself. However, that is not to say everyone who sees Jesus sees God. For instance, the Pharisees saw Jesus in the flesh, literally in the flesh. They got to experience something that in this point in time, this point in history, you and I will never get to experience on this side of eternity. But I think we can confidently say, was this an intimate, true, revelatory seeing of God? I think we can comfortably say no. Again, we go back to the question, who is qualified to see God? Do you want to see God? Do you want to know him? Well, Jesus' answer to this question is very simple. Only the pure in heart will see God. That is the main point of today's sermon And that is the teaching we find in this verse. Only the pure in heart will see God. So we're going to look at this point through two headers this morning. Number one, pursuing purity. And number two, seeing God. So first, starting with pursuing purity, if we're going to see God, we have to admit there's a problem for us. We must be pure in heart. In the Hebrew worldview, the heart was the the control center of a person's being. The Hebrew conception of the heart stands in stark contrast to the emotional center thought of the West. I need to feel it. I need my head to connect with my heart, people say in the West. On the contrary, the Hebrews understood the heart as the core of who we are. And so there's this interconnectedness about who we are, cognition, our our thoughts, affection, our, our desires, and volition, the will. As my biblical counselor professor in seminary would say, people are thinking beings, desiring beings, and choosing beings simultaneously. And from the biblical worldview, the human heart is where all the thinking, all the desiring, all the the choosing takes place. It's central to who we are as human beings created in the image of God. Now again, the problem is the human heart has been corrupted by sin since Genesis 3. Really, who can say they are pure in heart? I'm guessing many of you are familiar with the words from Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Again, the deceitful and desperately sick condition goes all the way back, all the way back to the fall. And throughout Scripture, in both Testaments, a call is issued to examine the heart. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, 
David says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Later on in Matthew's gospel, Jesus will say, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. You see, the natural heart abhors the things of God. And not only that, it takes things that are good and uses it for selfish means. For instance, the human heart will utilize an outward pursuit of virtue for inwardly evil and self-centered gain. Of course, it has been well documented the Pharisees were professionals of duplicity. Outward purity with inward filth, they performed acts outwardly to receive the praise of men. Jesus condemns them in Matthew 23, verses 25 and 26. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. But before we go pointing the finger at at those in the biblical text, we must also see ourselves in the text. A pharisaical heart resides inside all of us. Cultural illustration, Asians, including those of Chinese descent, are all about looking humble outwardly. Don't overtly show off. If, if your kid gets into a prestigious university, tell your friend he got lucky to get in. Must have been an admissions error, but we'll, we'll take the acceptance. All the while, there's a sense of internal pride that your kid got in and your friend's kid didn't. And to our core, we're self-focused and we take pleasure in looking in the mirror to celebrate ourselves. Every human, to some degree, can relate to the, the Greek myth of Narcissus. Narcissus, a charming and handsome young man, he rejected the The interests of nymphs attracted to him because of his beauty. And as a result, a nymph prayed that the the self-infatuated narcissist would experience unreturned love. Nemesis, the Greek goddess of anger, hearing the prayer of the nymph, answered that prayer by implanting a permanent self-love into Narcissus' heart. And then the following day, Narcissus looked into the pool of clear water and could not look away because of his self-obsessed gaze. Eating, drinking, and all the other life tasks took a backseat to looking at himself. Eventually, he died because nothing else mattered to him. And on his way to Hades on the riverboat, the story goes, the last thing he saw was his own reflection in the water. Of course, that's an extreme example. But there's a narcissist. There's a narcissist who lives in all of us. Seeing God is not on the heart of the natural man, so long as we can see ourselves. If anyone is going to see God in the eternal state, he or she needs a new heart. Now, those in the Old Testament living under the Old Covenant, they were looking forward to the fulfillment of God's promised gift of a new heart. Ezekiel, he prophesied about such a fulfillment in 36, 26 of his prophecy, where the Lord speaks through him, saying, And I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Jeremiah says something very similar in Jeremiah 31, 33. 
For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. That will be their God, and they shall be my people. In order for you and I to have a pure heart, first, a supernatural work needs to take place in us. God, the Holy Spirit, must grant the heart of flesh that Ezekiel talks about. What the language of both Ezekiel and Jeremiah signifies is the language of conversion. In our New Testament, New Covenant context, God grants a new heart as repentant sinners believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible speaks of conversion via many different metaphors. And the metaphor of receiving a new heart is one of the most relatable ones. Someone who has a stony heart has zero spiritual life. Conversely, someone who has the law written on his or her heart indeed has true spiritual life. The natural heart, the the heart of stone Ezekiel speaks of, is incapable of pursuing purity. The beatitude of blessed are the pure in heart, this beatitude assumes a person has put their trust in the one who spoke these words, namely Jesus. Have you received a new heart? In the language of John, have you been born again? In gospel presentation terms, have you confessed your sin and impurity of heart to the Lord? Have you repented of your sins, turning away from the rotten fruit of a sinful heart? Have you trusted in the person and the work of Jesus Christ? That is, his perfect life lived according to God's moral standards. His sacrificial death on the cross to pay the penalty of your sins. His burial in the grave and his glorious resurrection to conquer death and the penalty of sin. The only way you can receive a new heart is by repenting of your sin and trusting in the one who died for your sin and the one who was raised to conquer the sin in your life. Have you given your heart to Jesus? The only way anyone can be pure in heart is by giving their heart to Jesus. If you haven't, if you have not yet done so, today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Turn from your sin and and trust in the one who is able to forgive you and purify your heart. Pursuing purity begins with having a new heart. Now for my brothers and sisters who have already become believers through faith in Jesus, the crucified and resurrected Son of God, take a moment to reflect upon your own conversion i said this before and I'll say it again. Whether you've been a Christian for six months or 60 years, what was it like for you to hear God's call on your life? Be it through a sermon you heard or a a friend or a parent sharing the gospel with you or you reading the Bible on your own. You may not even view your conversion as a particular moment, like a single dot in time, but rather as a general period of time. Whatever it is, recall that moment or period of time when the Lord opened your eyes to see him. Meditate on it and and give your heart opportunity to worship God. Every time someone is given a a new heart, that is a miracle. Only God can replace a heart of stone with a beating heart of flesh. And fellow believer, you are a walking miracle. You are a walking miracle. Give glory to God for that. And worship with your whole heart. Worship His holy name. Furthermore, Worship him by pursuing purity, 
Pursue purity functionally in your heart. When we trust in Christ, he indeed purifies us. And we are forgiven and and cleansed and declared righteous, not on our own basis, but on the basis of Christ's righteousness applied to us. However, functionally, we still need purification. We need God to purify our desires. There's a couple of categories purity related that Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 5, 8. Number one, purity of morality. We still pursue things that are filthy in this life. Our hearts, though beating and lively with spiritual blood flowing through them, they still long for things that displease the Lord. The narcissist in us, again, he he still lives. And in the words of the Apostle John, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life still remains in our members. The pursuit of purity is a, a daily fight to mortify the flesh. It is the life of self-denial and active forsaking of that which we know is displeasing to the Lord. One of the ways we grow in our pursuit of what is good, true, and beautiful is to expose ourselves to what is good, true, and beautiful. Cultivating a heart for purity of what pleases God is not just about saying no to the world. That's an important part of it, but not the only part of it. It involves actively exposing our hearts to that which is true goodness, that which is true righteousness, and that which is true beauty. Practically speaking, this means growing in our love for for God's word. As a Bible-saturated as, as Bible-saturated as you think you are, or as you think this church is, you simply don't have enough. The reality is we can never, ever get enough of God's word. Listen to the psalmist in the 119th Psalm, verse 97 through 104, where he says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from, evil, from, from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Also, it involves a prayer for understanding God's word. It might be repetitive for you, but it's not a meaningless prayer from my mouth. Every single Sunday, mainly a prayer of illumination. Open up our eyes that we may behold wonderful things from your law. Incline our hearts to your testimonies and, and not to dishonest gain. And establish your word to your servants as that which produces reverence for thee. You could probably say it by memory. All from various portions of Psalm 119. And the pursuit of purity is never separated from God's good revelation. Therefore, pursuing a purity of of morality, number one, but also, number two, pursue a, a purity of motive. If we are capable of having mixed motives, and we are, we must ask the Spirit to refine our motives. I'll repeat what I quoted for you earlier, Psalm 139, 24, and 25. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and and lead me in the way everlasting. 
a few suggestions here on how to purify your motive. First, set your mind on the things above. When disciples of Jesus think about the heavenly glories and the life to come and their own heavenly citizenship, oftentimes it prevents us from acting and choosing based on temporal pleasures. Our motivation and the decisions we make now is purified to aim for what is lasting. Second, set your mind on the beauty that is around you in the here and now. Develop a lens to see how God is active and working in your life. Train your mind, discipline your mind to see his activity in the daily life. When you're more aware of his fingerprints in your day-to-day, it will motivate you to give thanks and also to want to join him in whatever he's doing. Third and finally, actively think about the needs of others. Looking away from ourselves helps us to become less self-centered in our intentions. And as obvious as that is, it's, it's really hard to do, isn't it? Regularly ask yourself, how can I help this person out? What kind word or, or sometimes rebuking word can I, can I speak? How is this action going to benefit my neighbor? Pursuing purity indeed leads to the good life. And not only does it lead to the good life, it is the good life. Purity allows for God's people to see God. Now it's here where we come to the second header of the sermon, seeing God. Seeing God stands as the climactic experience for humans who were created in God's image. We have been wired at our core to seek out such an experience. Revelation 22.4, they, that is God's elect, will see his face. Seeing God is something we often think about in the future tense. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But as we've been talking about in this sermon on the Sermon on the Mount series, the kingdom of heaven has made its inroads into the present world and into our present experience. Indeed, we get glimpses of God's face. We get glimpses of God's face in the here and now. Seeing God in the face of Christ enables us to experience in part what will one day be in full. Be reminded of various descriptions of Jesus found in the pages of the New Testament. Rapid fire, I'll read them off for you. They're posted behind me. Hebrews 1.3, he that is Jesus is the radiance of God the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature. Colossians 1.15, he, again, this is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Colossians 1.19, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Colossians 2.9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Therefore, to know Jesus and to walk intimately with him, following him, and observing all that he has commanded, that is to see God in the present life. An increasing view of God will be magnifying in the heart of the Christ follower who takes his call seriously to follow him. Later on in Jesus' sermon, he teaches on light and darkness. If you want, you can actually just flip a chapter forward to Matthew chapter 6, and in that section, he, he, expo- he, he explains the importance of laying treasures in heaven and on earth, and then in verses 22 and 23, he says this, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. 
If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, typically, we understand the eye to be an organ that takes in, don't we? It's, you see a vision and it, you, you take that vision in and you internalize that, that vision. It absorbs and it receives light that is the eye. You have to be careful what enters your eye. And, and all of that's true. But biblically speaking, in ancient times, the eyes were the organ to function as the reverse. The eye was viewed similarly to the sun, radiating light from within. And to see the eye was to see what was inside of someone, to see their makeup and to see their character. And if the heart is pure, then the eyes will be pure. If the heart is dark, darkness will emanate from someone's eyes. That's where the terminology of evil eye comes from. Also, the reverse is true. Whatever you set your eyes on, both material and immaterial now, those things will inevitably influence your heart. The more and more we set our eyes on Jesus and his values, the more and more we will see him and look like him. The more and more we set our hearts on the things of the world, the more and more our hearts will be turned away from him. Therefore, brothers and sisters, gaze upon him so that your eye can can both see him and radiate him. Now, the here and now that we experience in this world serves as preview and preparation for seeing him on that future day. Purity of heart that we're given in Christ and and that we also continue to develop, it helps us to see the Lord now. A Christian is able to see God in things like creation. How often have you gone to the edge of a cliff before an ocean or stood over the Grand Canyon or stood at the foot of a grand mountain range, or looked out on an airplane window to see the the celestial ball below, or stared into the starry night catching a flying star? How often have you done that and thought, majestic is the Lord. Majestic is the Lord. How wonderful is his name. And the purity of heart enables us to, to see the Lord indeed That he is behind all the artistry behind the created realm. Then from a different angle, Christians have been given the heart to see God as activity as, as they look back, as they look further and further back in the annals of history, both broad and personal. From the calling of Abraham to the modern day missions movement, God has been behind it all, drawing people to himself. Only a pure heart can see that. Or when someone says personally, I can look back in my life to see how God raised me in a home where the the gospel was preached and how its implications were lived out. No, it wasn't a perfect home, but yes, I saw God in my home through my parents and my family. That is a statement uttered from a pure heart. However, in my estimation, and also I think in the Bible's revelation, the clearest picture of God we can see in the here and now is in the church. After all, God promises his presence in the church. Matthew 18, verse 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Again, that's not a Bible study. That is the gathered church together in the context of church discipline, but nevertheless, the church, corporate. God's presence is manifested among his people, again, particularly in the corporate gathering. And as, individuals mem- as, as individual members grow in purity of heart, other members are able to see God in the midst of the interactions that they have with each other. Hopefully, as an encouragement to you, Allow me to illustrate my personal observation of seeing God in the lives of his people at this church. You may have similar observations. I've seen God's hand when people are sharing their testimonies at baptism. 
I've seen the Lord when church members actively serve in various capacities in order to uphold other members in church ministries within CBCOC. I've seen our good God when people are praying for one another on a Sunday evening fellowship or even outside of that. I've seen the Heavenly Father when his children welcomes others into their homes, investing in relationships over food and conversation. I've seen Jesus over an extended period of time when individuals have exhibited greater spiritual maturity from one degree to the next through the years. I've seen God as people have sought counsel regarding a a specific course of action, knowing for me personally they genuinely want to honor the Lord. I've seen the triune God when I see and hear people singing in this very room when I know you're walking through a trial in your life, that's why we have to sing to one another. I'm sure you could add to this list in your own personal experience here at CBCOC. All of this is preparing us to see him for who he is. We're all inhabiting We're all walking down a training ground, a space intended to prepare us for when we will see and experience his glorious presence in full. Are you excited to enter into glory? What do you think it's going to be like when the beatific vision becomes reality for you? There's definitely an unknown element about it. But what is sure has been revealed to us in God's word, both awe, wonder, and delight will fill our hearts. There will be no loss for us who are in Christ when we see him in glory. And indeed, that day cannot come soon enough. Christian artists and songwriters in the band named Mercy Me capture the wonder of what it will be like to see God, and to finally be with him. I'm sure many of you have heard of their famous song, I Can Only Imagine, recorded and released about 25 years ago. I'm not going to sing it for you, but let me conclude our time by reciting these lyrics. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes would see when your face is before me. I can only imagine, yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine, I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine, yeah, I can only imagine. Brothers and sisters, can you Imagine. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you that you've shown us yourself in your word and creation and also most specifically in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that for those who do not have a heart of flesh, that you would grant that gift to them, that you would replace their heart of stone with a heart of flesh, and that they would be able to see God. And Father, for those who have already professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would grow us in purity of heart, in morality, in motive, and that you would be preparing us to, to see God in the here and now, and that you would be escalating us to that point where we will one day indeed see God. 
Prepare us for that day, O Lord. We can only imagine what it will be like. Lord, continue to bless your church and also enable us to worship you joyfully by giving. I pray, Father, that you would bless the offering that's given from your people, that it would be an act of obedience, it would be an act of worship, it would be an act of joy to give unto you for the work of the ministry here at CBCOC. Father, thank you for your people. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.